Good evening, everyone. Time for another member update. Now, this is the oil chart provided by netdania.com. You can see this is the weekly, and uh, so that's a fairly long term view. It goes all the way back to 2004. Now, the thing that's interesting about this is that this bottoming that we had here in 2009, everything started to turn up in about March. That's when stuff took off. Now what's interesting here is that we're kind of doing the same thing here. We're up to 57.70 on the oil price, which is a pretty good rally from the low of about 42 bucks. Um, but it's not really, it doesn't really have any news to accompany it, which is kind of strange. Now you can see here that the MACD as well has turned, um, not as extreme of a dip, but still a very low dip relatively you know under the zero line we're rapidly approaching back to the zero line but there's really no news so are we going to get a financial catastrophe when things are moving up I don't know we're kind of in um, new territory here um, it's not really with there's no real precedent for what we're going through right now now if you're following the news the newly elected communists in Greece are taking the people's money. They took the pension money. Now they're taking the bank's money and municipalities and giving it to the Troika. This was no surprise to me. I told you that's what they were going to do. Uh, if they would have elected Golden Dawn, would they have done something different? Probably not. I, I don't think that any politicians are going to do what is in the people's interest. I said before, what's in the people's interest is to default on the debts and remake their economy and uh, just have a lower taxes and try to have a healthy functioning economy maybe go to Asia uh, ask the Koreans or the Taiwanese or uh, some Asian politicians how they run their economies um, but you know that's not the way they're going so they're taking now they're taking the savings of the Greek people they're going to send it off to the Troika and uh, it's going to get really ugly in Greece now, I wanted to make an, not an announcement, but an explanation of what's going on with the member site. I don't know how many of you follow the, the YouTubes on the public channel and stuff like that. When I initially set up the member site, what I did was I was trying to drive revenues over to the member site as opposed to YouTube. When we first started out with YouTube, YouTube was paying for everything. It took care of all our costs. Uh, those costs have dramatic; those uh, revenues have dramatically fallen off. Um, the blog's doing okay, but the, the YouTube has completely just collapsed. So initially, uh, we wanted to try to start off with having the videos released uh, seven days later than they are on the member site, and that's the pattern that we went with. Just recently, I started changing that. And I released a member update live and then, uh, or actually it was a silver update. I released it live. And so what I've decided to go with now is to do the majority of the member updates just stay on the member site and to try to drive people to the member site. I'm going to occasionally release a video, uh, maybe a silver update uh, once every couple weeks or something like that. It's just, it's not worth my time to maintain YouTube for the public um, so I'm gonna to try to use that model to try to drive interest in the membership site so if you notice uh, a video happens to be released to the public at the same time that's the reason why now let's get over to what's going to be the main topic of the night before I do that I want to let you know that I did make a purchase today I'm gonna to tell you what I purchased and where I purchased it and what I paid um, I was looking at coins like I always do on a daily basis and I started to see, um, well, for one thing, it, this started with the discussion on YouTube about how I commented about the lunar and the, t the lunar tiger and how um, I was trying to prove to people that my willingness to buy that for $40 proves what it's worth. But what really proves what it's worth is that no one's willing to sell it to me for forty dollars now uh, people can make a lot of excuses about you know why that is the case but the reality is 
that I'm willing to buy it for $40 and nobody is willing to sell it to me for $40. That ought to tell you something about what the coin is worth. Now, I was looking at the latest Lunars. They've become very thin. If you go over to Gainesville Coins, there's nothing but proofs now. Uh, Gainesville Coins has always had a decent amount of Lunars and even this year they had a decent amount of the goats. Now they have nothing. And so this is somewhat disturbing. Now this is JM Bullion. I've not purchased from them before. I did that today. And I bought, I only bought 50 of the two ounce uh, goats. And you can see the price there is 42.70. I was looking at the half ounce ones and the price was kind of climbing up on me around not a real comfort level for me. I was looking at 12.50 to 13 dollars with the price of silver being where it is you know uh that's that comes to 25 26 dollars and that's uh almost 10 bucks of a spot so that's too much for me right now and th and this one fit the bill because it's about uh at that low price there at the 20 price then that's about 21 35 an ounce that's a little high, but that's tolerable. That's uh, not that bad. That's a little bit above bullion uh, coins, say the maple and the eagle, but not enough to make you uncomfortable. I just happened to see today, I think actually this is what kind of uh, tripped it for me was I saw the two ounce, a two ounce tiger sold for $250. Um, so that, that kind of did it for me. I went and looked to see what was available, which I do almost on a daily basis. And these two ounces were really thinning out. So I decided to go ahead and pull the trigger. You can still get these if you want to follow me. Um, you can. There's 52 here left at JM Bullion. There are also some over in Provident Metals. Um, I don't think there are any left at Atmex. So it's going to be interesting going forward to see the next year's Lunar Series and if the Lunar Series just uh, dry up completely. So let's get to the main story of the night, and that's going to be this 2014 annual report from the United States Mint. Let me say it's very well done. It's very professional, and uh, they've done a very good job. Uh, but there's some, there's some telling stuff in here, and so I'm just going to kind of scroll through it and talk about some stuff that I found. Now, they talk about the bullion... Uh, the bullion sales were down. You can see fiscal year 2014 bullion coin sales mirrored their broader commodity markets throughout the year as investors sought different asset classes. Gold ounces were down 42.4% from fiscal year 2013, and silver ounces were also down by about 12.7%. So you can see that gold took a huge drop. Um, silver, not so much. Now, this is an interesting comment here. The Mint has been working tirelessly with its supply base since 2008 to increase the availability of silver blanks. Hmm. Well, I know one way to increase availability. Raise the price. <laughs> no, can't do that. And in fiscal year 2014, we completed a multi-year program to increase blank supply to more than 50 million blanks per year. We lifted allocation limits on silver bullion coins in June 2014 and were able to produce both gold and silver bullion coins to demand in fiscal year 2014. Importantly, the mint was able to fulfill demand when other global mints resumed allocation briefly late last year. In other words, allocation, that means shortage. Finally, in fiscal year 2014, the mint resumed production of the one ounce platinum bullion coin. So that's interesting. We're going to skip the numismatic stuff here. And there's your people from the Mint, their vision, their mission. Now here's a little chart here that shows their revenue. You can see 2014 was a pretty big down year for them. The revenue is actually lower. Keep in mind that revenue is going to be a function of the price of gold and silver because uh, somehow the margin that they're getting is, is going to be changed. You can see that bullion is 58.5% of their revenue and uh, this is circulating coins we don't care about this bullion coins uh, the mint is the world's largest producer of gold and silver bullion coins in 2014 we reintroduced platinum etc now look here and you can see revenue by program dollars and millions you can see it dropped significantly um, for 2014 but 
what I want you to note here is how large the revenue is for the American Silver Eagle. Now, uh, some people compare the Silver Eagle to the Gold Eagle, and you can see from this pie chart that's not exactly an accurate comparison. The comparison you want to make is gold to silver, and you have to add the Gold Eagle to the Gold Buffalo. You can see that Gold Buffalo did uh, roughly a third of what the uh, Gold Eagle did. So you got to add those together and it comes to about 920. Uh, but there's silver at 849. So you're looking at a one to one revenue ratio. Now that's really important. That's dollars and millions. If you think about it, this is the stuff that Eric Sprott is always talking about. How can it be that people are spending an equal amount of money on gold and physical gold and silver and yet it's coming out of the ground at 9 and 10 to 1. Something's got to give. What we're going to see here as we dig further that something is giving, but they're trying to cover it up. Now, we're not going to go into seniorage. Uh, there's going to be an interesting point when we look at the cost of the, of the circulating coinage. Now, remember, seniorage is simply the difference between the face value and the cost of producing the coins. So it's basically a profit that the mint makes. They pay it back to the treasury. But keep in mind, we're going to look at uh, the cost of those coins. Now, this is where demand slowed. Uh, a total bullion revenue. This is interesting because we saw that silver didn't go down that much. Demand for bullion coins slowed in fiscal year 2014 compared to last year's record-setting volume. The mint sold 39.7 million ounces of gold, silver, and platinum bullion, a decrease of 6.2 million ounces from last year. So that's what, 6.2? Um, you help me with the math. goes in there six, six and a half times, so that's what, 17%? Uh, so down 17%. The total bullion revenue decreased 44.1%. Okay, so you have a decrease in the ounces sold of 17%, but a decrease in the revenues of 44%. Interesting. Primarily due to a 52.6% decrease in gold bullion coin revenues. We're going to see when we look at the chart down below, the mint isn't making money off of the silver coins. Very, very little. It's the gold coins. Again, we're going to skip the numismatic products. Now, we're going to look at the circulating coins here real quick. These are total circulating coin production. You can see that it dropped off dramatically. This area here, actually, it's kind of interesting that they dropped off their production because this area here is where the seniorage started to go negative. And I'm going to show you that on the penny and the nickel when we get to that. Now, this is pointing that out here with the alternative metals. Okay, now if you remember, if you're a coin bug like I am, you'll remember that they have already changed the penny. Well, actually, let's do them in order. They changed the silver dollar, the half dollar, the the quarter, and the dime. And, you know, you look at your quarter and you look at your dime at the edge to see the copper and the zinc in there. They used to be silver. Now they're copper and zinc. The penny, up until 1982, was 100% copper. Well, 99 point whatever percent copper and now it's zinc with a copper coating. So they've already devalued the penny. Now the one you want to keep your eye on is the nickel because the nickel is the only coin that the mint currently produces that is actually the same metal content that it was. And we know what this means. It means that you know the value of the coin is exceeding uh, the cost of producing it. That means that there's inflation and and the government's caused it so let's read this here the mint submitted its first biennial report to congress in december 2012 which elevated 29 potential alternative metal alloys for circulating coins you ever collect some of the foreign coins they're all made out of aluminum you know you pick them up they don't weigh anything it's like a feather in your hand yeah well they're looking at alternative metal alloys and the reason why is because they're losing money and the reason that they're losing money is because uh, the inflation that that the federal reserve has caused so if you look here at these years here's the seniorage by year now when the price of those base metals was high you can see if you look on the one cent here 
you can see that uh, the seniorage basically was nothing there and uh, the seniorage mainly is in the dollar coin and in the quarter and we'll get down here and look at the costs here so you can see um, so th these are the costs of the various coins let's see we're gonna go with 2014 Uh, I thought there was one that gave us... No, these are the totals. I want to get... Here it is. Uh, the cost for the coin itself, okay? So you can see here, in 2014, the penny, you can see that. That's 0.016, okay? That's 1.66 cents a penny. That's what it costs to make a penny, 1.66 cents. The nickel, it costs 8 cents to make a nickel. So actually... For a while there, I was collecting nickels just because, just because I like to. Uh, I'd occasionally go and buy rolls of nickels and just throw them somewhere because they were worth more than I was paying for them, so I didn't see any reason why not to. So every once in a while, I'd pick up nickels. But actually, you can see now that the penny is actually more valuable. And this is a zinc penny. And so the zinc now, they can't even afford to make the pennies on the zinc. So the dime, you can see the dime only costs about four cents. So that's a long way away. Um, and then the quarter, of course, only costs about nine cents. So that's way far away. So the nickel, this is the one they're going to have to phase out. And the penny, they're going to have to phase that out too uh, because they're losing money. And they give you the charts. Now I want to get down to something that's really important here. And let's see here. Here is ounces. Let's look at the ounces real quick. Bullion coins, uh, ounces sold. You can see that huge drop in gold. Um, in 2010, you had 1,800 ounces that they sold, all the way down to 700. Now if you look at silver, silver hasn't really been phased. Yeah, it dropped down to about 39,000, but that was after a record of 44,000. So silver is holding very strong there. Um, and then there's the sales revenues. So you can see here, this is another one I wanted to point out here. These different columns show you, um, you want to look at this column here, the, uh, the bullion net margin. That's going to tell you how profitable the issue is. And you can see here they all come in about you know two percent or so except for silver and it comes in at 0.7 percent the silver eagle so that gives you a hint there they're not making any money they didn't make any money in 2013 on the silver eagle and we're actually negative 2012. so let's get down and look at these financials here uh, because there's some interesting stuff Oh, I wanted to read this um, silver bullion coin results. Although every quarter of fiscal year 2014 saw lower investor demand for silver bullion compared to last year, demand tapered off significantly from June through August before improving September. Lower silver spot prices resulted in lower revenue. Fiscal year 2014 silver bullion ounces sold were 12.7% lower than the record set last year, while revenue is down 32.8% and earnings were down 24.4%. Sales of American Eagle silver bullion coins decreased by 12%, etc., etc., etc. The mint increased blank supplies this year for American silver eagle bullion coins. Demand had outpaced supply since January 28, 2013, when the 2013 American silver eagle bullion coins went on allocation. Demand was high throughout fiscal year 2013 and the first part of 2014. As more blanks became available, the Mint took these coins off allocation in June and increased production met the demand for those popular investment products. Now we're going to get into that when we look at their statement about hedging. And this is where this thing gets very, very interesting. And that's when we get down into this revenue statement Sorry, I've lost track of some of the stuff. It's, there's a lot of information here. So we want to get down to the financial statement. And this is where he's going to talk about the hedging and uh, also these terms that they use, deep storage, which is 
kind of interesting. Um, there's you have to read between the lines, but there's there's definitely something here. So KPMG has audited them. This is their balance sheet, and um, then we get down here to the comments on the balance sheet, and and these are the ones that are interesting. So here's the earned revenues and seniorage inventories. Okay. United States custodial gold and silver reserves. United States gold and silver reserves consist both of both deep storage and working stock of gold and silver. Deep storage is defined as that portion of the United States gold and silver reserves which meet the mint security which the mint secures in sealed vaults. Deep storage gold comprises the vast majority of the bullion reserve. They see that? Deep storage gold comprises the vast majority of the bullion reserve. You think they have sealed vaults of silver? I don't think so. Deep storage silver is also primarily in bar form. Okay, well, they kind of say that. Then they give you the working stock. and compare the differences with these statements. Treasury allows the Mint to use some of its gold as working stock in the production of gold coins. This allows the Mint to avoid the market risk associated with buying gold in advance of the sales date of the gold coins. The Mint replenishes the Treasury gold working stock at or just prior to the time the coins are sold. Generally, the Mint does not deplete the working stock used in production. Interesting, okay? They do not deplete the working stock. Instead, the mint will purchase a like amount of gold on the open market to replace the working stock used. See that? So they keep a steady working stock, and if it goes down, they replace it. Treasury also allows the mint to use a silver as a working stock. However, Treasury does not have enough silver to fulfill all the mint's manufacturing needs. Accordingly, for the purpose of avoiding market risk and associated, associated with owning silver, the mint has entered into a silver hedging arrangement. Now, isn't that interesting? The market risk with owning silver, is that why they're in this hedging arrangement? Or are they in the hedging arrangement because they don't have any silver stock? See note 20. So it gets a little bit more mysterious here. Let's go down here. Before we get to note 20, there's another little note here. Hedging. The mint engages in a hedging program to avoid the effects of fluctuating silver costs. Hmm, what about fluctuating gold costs? Nope, just silver. As a result of the changes in market prices, the mint purchases silver in large quantities and sells an interest in that silver to a trading partner while maintaining physical custody and the title to the silver. Sales of silver to the trading partner are made at the same spot price that the mint paid to obtain the silver on the open market. The partner's interest in the mint's silver is reduced as finished silver bullion coins are sold to authorized purchasers. Repurchasers of the trading partner's interest in the silver occurs upon sale of coins by the mint. Repurchases that are made on the same day as sales in the same quantity sold and using the same spot prices as was used for the sale of the AP. Each sale to and from the trading partner carries a small transaction fee. The selling and buying fees net a cost of one half of 1%. The Mint incurred 181,000 in hedging fees in 2014 compared to 212 in uh, 13. Interesting. They don't have to go through this, all this hedging stuff and have a partner. Hmm, who's this partner? For gold. No, they just have to do it for silver. So let's get down to this mysterious note number 20. And that's the one where they're gonna tell us about this hedging that they have to do because they don't have enough silver. And here it is, the hedging program. At September 30th, 2014 and 2013, the market value of the silver sold to the trading partner and not yet sold by the mint and therefore not repurchased from the trading partner was 301.9 million and 251.8 million respectively. 
At September 30th, 2014, the trading partner owed the Mint $4.4 million in unpaid realized gains, while at September 30th, 2013, neither the Mint nor the trading partner owed the other for unpaid realized gains or losses. In fiscal year 2014, the Mint recorded an unrealized loss of $5.7 million compared to an unrealized loss of $4 million in 2013. So you tell me. Why are they hedging? Who is this trading partner? And why are they selling silver at a loss? I think we know the answer to these questions. It's interesting, though, to see the Mint admit these things in a kind of backhanded way. So I'm going to go ahead and link that report. That's kind of interesting stuff. So back to the chart. Uh, silver is really not doing anything, kind of drifting lower. Like I said, I decided to pull the trigger on those two ounce goats. I just don't see how you can lose on those. Uh, basically, we're talking about 2150 a coin. I'm very happy with that. Um, if you guys want to follow me, the only ones I know of are going to be on Jam, Bullion, and Provident Metals. And we'll talk to you next time.